Hi, I'm Dr. Betty Maloney. As you may have discovered, there are lots of myths and misconceptions about Lyme disease. In this presentation, I'll cover the basic facts about Lyme disease in the United States. I hope you find it helpful. Hi, I'm Dr. Betty Maloney. In this slide presentation, I'll review basic information about Lyme disease. The U.S. is home to a variety of soft and hard ticks. As a group, the six hard ticks pictured here transmit these different illnesses. This is just a partial listing of all the tick-borne diseases that occur in our country. Different ticks transmit different infections, but as you can see, there's a lot of overlap. Today's talk is about protecting you. Here's a list of what I'll be covering. One, why you should know about Lyme disease. Two, how Lyme may affect you. Three, how you can become infected. And four, what you can do to prevent that from happening. Why do you need to know about Lyme disease? For starters, it's the most common vector-borne illness in the United States, and case numbers have been increasing. Most people who get Lyme will be successfully treated, but for some, Lyme becomes a debilitating chronic illness. The risk of getting Lyme disease is much higher than most people recognize. In some ways, Lyme is like an iceberg. The CDC used to emphasize surveillance case numbers, but surveillance cases are a special type of case. Approximately 30,000 are reported to the CDC each year. Think of them as the tip of the Lyme iceberg, with the rest of it hidden from view. Can you answer this question? What percentage of cases is underwater? If your answer was close to 90%, congratulations. The CDC estimates that there are 300,000 new cases each year, which is 10 times higher than what gets reported. Lyme can cause serious problems. Not only is it costly, it can be disabling and reduce someone's ability to work or go to school. A national survey of people who reported having chronic Lyme found that two-thirds reduced their school and work hours and a quarter received disability payments. Only a few doctors know how to treat complicated cases of Lyme disease. Most others have been led to believe that Lyme is relatively uncommon and doesn't cause chronic problems. Because they simply don't see the need for advanced training or managing patients with the Lyme disease, we're left with a shortage of qualified doctors. Knowing your risk of Lyme disease is the first step in preventing it. Looking at this map of the reported cases that meet the surveillance case definition, you can see that most cases are concentrated in the Northeast and Upper Midwest. But if you scan the map, you'll see pockets near Seattle and San Francisco and cases all along the Gulf Coast. The rest of the country has scattered cases. Cases are reported based on where someone lives, and that may not be where they got infected. For example, a case reported in Montana might have been picked up during a trip to Connecticut. Even within the high-risk states, the risk is not equally distributed. Some counties may have very high rates, while neighboring ones have very few. Anything that puts you in tick habitat puts you at risk. A few examples are shown here. People who reside in or visit housing developments in wooded areas that have a local deer population might be exposed on their own property. Sports that are played in areas with longish grass and hobbies like geocaching put you in harm's way. Outdoors people like hunters, campers, and hikers are at risk. So are pet owners. You may stay clear of tick habitat, but if your pets are allowed to roam freely, they may bring a tick home to you. Risk is also related to age. This graph shows that school-age kids have the highest risk, followed by middle-aged adults. Before we get too far, let me give you a brief overview of the disease itself. Lyme is a bacterial infection. Humans and animals can become infected if they're bitten by an infected black-legged tick often known as a deer tick. Lyme has three distinct stages, early, late, and persistent disease. Not everyone goes through each stage. 
Symptoms vary from person to person. Lyme is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, which is actually a family of bacteria. In the United States, we only have one major species, but Europe has at least three to deal with. Individual species differ from each other in ways that can affect test results and treatment. Plus, each species may have dozens of variants known as strains. The bacteria is sneaky and it can adapt to life in a wide variety of host animals without being killed by their immune systems. Getting back to the illness, it's important to recognize that no two patients look the same and an individual symptoms often change from day to day or week by week. In early disease, the bacteria is only in the skin, but later on it spreads throughout the body. It especially likes to attack nerves, joints, and the brain. Both of these stages need to be treated with antibiotics. Despite treatment, some people never get well. These folks have persistent Lyme disease, which is sometimes called chronic Lyme. Early Lyme disease usually begins one to two weeks after a bite from an infected tick, but it can show up anywhere from two to 30 days. It has four main forms. Some people have no symptoms. Others have an erythema migrans rash. A third group may feel like they have a summertime flu with fevers, chills, and body aches, but no rash. The fourth group is the luckiest. They have the rash and feel fluish. I consider them lucky because they're most likely to be correctly diagnosed and treated early. Treatment for early Lyme disease requires at least three weeks of an oral antibiotic such as amoxicillin, ceftin, or doxycycline. I analyzed all of the U.S. trials on the erythema migrans rash and found that too many people remained ill if they received less than 20 days of antibiotics. Although some doctors still order blood tests for patients with early Lyme disease, it's important for you to know that the results often cause confusion. The tests look for antibodies to the bacteria, but it takes time for your body to make them. Studies have shown that most people test negative when they develop their rash. These false negatives may mislead your doctor into thinking Lyme has been ruled out, but that simply isn't true. For this reason, tests are not recommended for patients with early Lyme disease. The hallmark of early Lyme disease is the erythema migrans rash, which is often abbreviated to EM. The rash has to be bigger than five centimeters or two and a half inches to qualify for the CDC definition. This picture shows the typical appearance of the rash, a solid colored oval. The color can range anywhere from a faint pink to a very deep red. The classic bullseye rash is the best known type of EM rash, but it isn't very common. EMs will expand and then clear over many weeks, whether or not you've been treated. The rash clears quickly once antibiotics are started. It may surprise you to hear that according to CDC statistics, 30% of all Lyme disease patients never develop a rash during the early phase of their illness. Here are a few more EM rashes. At 11 o'clock is the classic target lesion, but remember, it's not very common. The rash next to it is pretty faint. On people who are darkly pigmented, the rash might look like a bruise. Depending on its location, an EM may be mistaken for ringworm or eczema. It can also look like a different skin infection called cellulitis. That can be a problem because the antibiotics that are commonly used for cellulitis don't work for Lyme disease. Here's my suggestion. If you're diagnosed with cellulitis when ticks are active in your area, ask your doctor to give you Augmentin or Ceftin because these antibiotics will work for both conditions. In late disease, the infection isn't confined to just the skin. By entering blood vessels or lymphatics, the bacteria can travel throughout the body and potentially infect any tissue or system, although some, like the musculoskeletal and nervous systems, are more commonly affected. Where the bacteria finally settle often determines what symptoms a person will have. This is a short list of symptoms or problems that are commonly seen in late disease. They usually start a few weeks after the bite 
but some may not show up for several years. The fatigue and pain that occurs in this stage can be very disabling. I recall one patient who said she couldn't get out of bed even though the baby was crying. Many people have pain from Lyme arthritis, but the pain we're talking about here is due to nerve irritation from the infection. This nerve pain, or neuropathic pain, is very similar to the pain of diabetic neuropathy. As we know from commercials, certain medicines can alleviate the pain from diabetic neuropathy, and those meds often work for Lyme pain. Now I'll go through a few of the most common forms of late disease. Sometimes people will suddenly develop multiple EM rashes. Although it may seem like they had several simultaneous tick bites, what really happened was that the bacteria circulated in the bloodstream and then came back to the skin in multiple places. Another common problem is facial nerve palsy, which is when the muscles on one side of the face don't work. Bell's palsy is a form of facial nerve palsy, but in that situation, doctors don't know why the nerve isn't working, and they commonly try treating it with steroids. That's a bad idea if you actually have Lyme disease and not Bell's palsy. Here again, test results can be falsely negative. So, if you develop facial nerve palsy during the summer, make sure your doctor strongly considers Lyme disease and doesn't rely on tests to rule it out. Many experts advise treating for Lyme disease and avoiding steroids. Months or years later, 60% of those who are infected but untreated will develop Lyme arthritis. The knee is the most commonly affected joint, but it can hit anywhere. When small joints are involved, people can be misdiagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. When the infection spreads to the heart, it can cause a lot of inflammation, which can be deadly. The CDC recently published case studies about previously healthy adults who died from Lyme carditis. The electrical system is most commonly involved. It causes the heart to beat irregularly. Brief episodes of a rapid heartbeat can occur, but the real worry is that the heart will beat too slowly. Some patients need a temporary pacemaker. When the heart muscle is involved, the heart can't pump blood very well, and people may have symptoms of heart failure. Rarely, the infection causes inflammation of the outer lining of the heart. This produces pain when someone takes a deep breath. Lyme can get to the brain and infect the tissue that covers the brain and spinal cord. This is meningitis, and it causes headaches and neck stiffness. Lyme meningitis is described as smoldering because other bacterial causes of meningitis cause more dramatic symptoms from day one. Blood tests can be falsely negative, and lumbar punctures, often called spinal taps, might have only slight abnormalities. That's why many patients with Lyme meningitis are misdiagnosed with viral meningitis. Late neurologic disease is a form of Lyme disease that can be especially hard to recognize. It usually develops months or years after a bite, and we don't know how many people are affected. In this stage, the brain and nerves aren't working properly. Since the nervous system controls so many aspects of our bodily functions, people have a wide range of symptoms such as numbness, tingling, nerve pain, difficulty thinking, loss of math or language skills. They may also develop psychiatric conditions such as depression or anxiety. Lyme also mimics several nervous system diseases including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and MS. These illnesses lack definitive testing, so people who are diagnosed with one of them and who are at risk for having Lyme disease should be sure that their doctor has considered the possibility of Lyme. Lyme testing is a complicated topic. Here are a few things you should know. The most commonly used tests look for antibodies to the Lyme bacteria and not the bacteria itself. Positive results indicate previous exposure but don't necessarily indicate a current infection. Tests are often wrong and there are many different reasons for that. Tests can be falsely negative if they're done too soon before antibodies develop or if they're done too late after antibodies fade away. 
Sometimes the tests miss antibodies that are present. False positives do occur, but the CDC testing procedure was set up so that only 1% of all positives are false. Although many people, including doctors, think that positive results remain positive forever, that isn't true. Patients can be reinfected with Lyme disease, and positive results during the course of the second or third or fourth infection shouldn't necessarily be viewed as being due to the previous infection. Lyme disease symptoms are so variable that no two patients look exactly alike. And because Lyme can mimic other diseases and blood tests are often unreliable, it can be very difficult for doctors to make the diagnosis. Here are some of the many diseases doctors have to consider when they're evaluating someone who may potentially have Lyme disease. It's likely that they'll need to run lots of tests. That's a good thing because the goal is not to diagnose everyone with Lyme. The goal is to diagnose everyone correctly. Lyme is a bacterial infection, so antibiotics are required. Treatment works best early on, during the rash phase, but even then, antibiotics don't always cure people. Those who remain ill have persistent Lyme disease. No one knows why some people remain ill or what to do for them. Many theories exist, but few have been proven. One thing that is known is that the bacteria has ways to trick the immune system and avoid being killed by antibiotics. It's also known that some Lyme patients will improve when they receive additional antibiotics. There may be other things to try. This uncertainty has led to disagreements and medical controversy. We really need more research in order to get everything figured out. Here are my general recommendations for treating different situations. Every patient situation is different, so use them to guide a discussion with your doctor. Deer tick bites should be treated for 10 to 20 days. The common practice of using just two doxycycline pills isn't very effective at preventing Lyme disease. Early Lyme disease, with the EM rash, summertime flu, or both, should be treated for 21 to 28 days, six weeks if there are multiple EM rashes or nerve symptoms. Late and persistent Lyme can be difficult to treat. Find an experienced doctor to work with your doctor or to take over this aspect of your medical care. Let's shift gears and talk about black-legged ticks because without them, Lyme wouldn't be an issue. This picture shows the tick's distinctive appearance, a black cape against a reddish-brown body. Black-legged ticks live for two years and can survive the harshest winters. Here's the tick family photo, mom, dad, big brother, and little sister or more properly, adult female, adult male, nymph and egg. The egg stage isn't shown. These ticks are small. That's a nymph on a thumbnail. Larvae hatch from eggs in the spring of year one and seek a meal. Once fed, they become nymphs and essentially sleep until the following spring. They take a second meal, molt into adults. Adults mate in the fall and males typically die. Females live through the winter. They take a third meal before laying eggs and dying. The life cycle continually repeats itself. Ticks feed on a variety of different mammals. The exact type varies by geographic region. Mice, squirrels, chipmunks, shrews, and ground-dwelling birds are the most common hosts. Every meal is a chance to become infected, and once a tick is infected, it remains infected. Subsequent feedings allow it to spread the infection. People, pets, horses, and livestock are called incidental or dead-end hosts because these sorts of infections in this group rarely get passed on to a new host. By the way, larvae don't hatch out infected, so if you're bitten by a larva, you won't get Lyme. Only nymphs and adults transmit Lyme disease. Ticks dry out easily, so they require a habitat that's moist. They like to shade in areas where moisture is trapped. Places like long grass, leaf litter, fallen logs, and the edge of woods. Tick-friendly spots around your home would be bird baths and shady vegetation. Ticks will also be found in areas where mice and other hosts go, such as bird feeders and woodpiles. 
Young ticks are close to the ground, and adults can be several feet higher. Ticks don't jump or fall out of trees. They move short distances on their own or on small mammals. Long distance travel is by deer or birds. Black-legged ticks don't go and find a host. Instead, they crawl to the edge of vegetation and wait for something to pass by. Then they grab on whatever brushes them. This behavior is called questing. Black-legged ticks spread more than just Lyme disease. These other infections are called co-infections. So far, seven have been identified. They're listed in this table. Expect to see more. Because black-legged ticks can carry more than one bacteria or virus at a time, a single bite can result in multiple diseases. Co-infections really complicate the picture because many of these illnesses look a lot like Lyme and it can be difficult to know which infection a person has. People can have more than one infection at a time. Those with multiple infections will have more symptoms and be sicker. Some of the co-infections need antibiotics that are entirely different from what's used for Lyme disease. So people with more than one infection might find themselves on combinations of antibiotics and it may be harder for them to get well. Because Lyme disease is a serious illness that's increasingly common and tricky to diagnose and treat, you should make every effort to prevent it. Think of prevention as a three-legged stool. Unless you pay attention to all three legs, people, pets, and property, there's a good chance the stool will tip over and you may become infected. People need layered protection. Avoiding tick bites is key. You'll also need to do a tick check after each exposure so that any newly attached tick can be removed quickly. And if you find a tick that's had time to feed, talk to your doctor about taking antibiotics to prevent the infection from taking hold. Now let's talk about the details. Avoiding ticks is the best way to keep from being bitten. It's important to know where and when you might encounter ticks and to stay out of those areas whenever possible. This is especially true during the spring and fall when ticks are actively biting. When you are in tick habitat, minimize your exposure. Stay in the center of trails and avoid risky areas such as leaf litter and fallen logs. If you can't avoid being exposed to ticks, it's important to take steps that reduce the chance of a bite. This woman may not be a fashion guru, but she sure knows how to dress up for ticks. All of her clothing has been pre-treated with permethrin. I'll come back to that. Ticks can't bite through clothes, so use long sleeves and pants to cover as much skin as possible. Light-colored fabric makes it easier to spot a tick. Tucking pants into socks keeps ticks from crawling under your pant cuffs. Hairstyles and hats keep ticks away from the scalp. When you come in from tick habitat, take your clothes off before walking through your house. Put them in the dryer on high heat. 10 minutes for clothes that are dry, longer, maybe up to an hour, for clothes that are wet. This kills ticks by drying them out. Washing alone won't work. If you remember only one thing from this talk, remember this twist on an old proverb. An ounce of permethrin is worth a pound of antibiotics. Clothes and outdoor gear should be pre-treated with permethrin. Here's why. Permethrin's an insecticide and it kills ticks on contact, yet it's safe to use on clothing and gear. It provides long-lasting protection, usually two to six weeks, because once it dries, it bonds tightly to whatever it's on. Items treated with permethrin can get wet or even washed and still be protected. Some clothing lines have permethrin embedded in the fabric and the manufacturers say the protection lasts through 70 washings. Regarding safety, the EPA has tested permethrin extensively and found it to be very safe. The military agrees and uses permethrin embedded fatigues in tick areas. By the way, although permethrin isn't supposed to be applied directly to the skin for tick bite prevention, that's exactly what's done when people have a case of scabies. And in those instances, it's put on for two days in a row before showering off. Repellents are different from insecticides. 
They don't kill ticks. They work by getting the tick to move off of treated items and skin. There are several types of repellent, and this table compares three. DEET's been around the longest, and it comes in all sorts of formulations. You need at least a 30% concentration to repel ticks. DEET can harm synthetic fabrics, nylons, and polyester, as well as natural products like rubber and leather. There have been some questions about its safety. While the U.S. EPA thinks it's fine for anyone over two months of age, the Canadian Health Ministry discourages using DEET on children. Bicaridin is newer than DEET, but it's been around for many years. It's safe for all fabrics and gear. There's no concern about using it on children. Bicaridin comes in sprays, lotions, and wipes. You want a concentration of 10 to 20 percent. BioUD is newer. It's made from wild tomato plants and comes in a spray or lotion. There are no use limits on its use, but it needs to be replied every two hours or so. You won't find it in stores, but you can buy it online. Lots of natural products are said to be good repellents, but they haven't gone through formal testing. Since the other products I mentioned are safe and effective, best to stick with them. Once you come inside after an exposure to tick habitat, you should look to see if any tick managed to attach itself to you. Tick checks need to be body-wide. Ideally, you would come in, shower vigorously, and then do the check. Studies have found that if you shower within two hours of exposure, you can reduce your risk of Lyme disease. Tick checks are very effective, but they must be done carefully and after each exposure. You also need to remember that your target is very small. Here's a picture of a nymph on someone's fingernail. If you rush through your check, it's likely you'll miss seeing ticks. If you find a tick, it's really no big deal to remove it. You can use a special remover or a fine tweezer. Grab the tick as close to the skin as possible and pull steadily upward. If you use a jerky motion, you'll probably end up leaving the head behind. Don't worry too much if that happens, your body will expel it. Wash the bite with soap and water. Antiseptics and band-aids are optional. Watch for rashes and flu-like symptoms. Some people are allergic to tick saliva and will develop a red rash around the bite site. This usually happens within a few hours and unlike an EM, an allergic rash is usually gone within 48 hours of the bite. Save the tick if you can. Your doctor might want to confirm that it's a black-legged tick. Contact your doctor as soon as possible after a bite. In many areas, 30% or more of the black-legged ticks carry Lyme disease and bite durations of 24 hours or longer are at risk for Lyme disease. The longer the tick is fed, the greater the risk. In some instances, it makes sense to take a few weeks of antibiotics to prevent Lyme disease altogether. I wrote a paper on this that was published in the Wisconsin Medical Journal. Look for a link on our resources page. So if you get bitten, download the paper and have your doctor read it before the two of you decide what to do. Regardless of your choice, watch for rashes or any signs of early Lyme disease and report them immediately to your doctor. Companion animals generally need the same strategies that we use on humans. Try to keep your pet from entering tick habitat. Animals have different products than humans and different animal species often need different products. Pets that go outdoor need tick checks just like humans. Ticks might not bite a properly treated animal, but they may use it as a way to get indoors, increasing your risk of a bite. Here are some different things that you can do for pets. Dogs are lucky. There's a vaccine for them. Several items are applied to the animal's coats and others to the skin. The skin products disperse out from the treatment site to protect the entire animal. Collars are another option. Many products are species specific. Given all of the options and potential harm from using the wrong product, best to check with your vet about what strategies will work for your animal. It's important that you keep your yard as risk-free as possible. Tick-proof the areas in your yard that you use. Clear away areas where ticks can hide or where mice or deer would feel welcomed. Don't feed deer or provide salt licks. 
avoid using plants that deer eat. Bird feeders attract mice, so move them to areas you don't use. The same is true for bird baths, because the water that falls to the ground helps keep ticks from drying out. Keep your grass cut short. Natural sunlight will kill ticks if they don't have moisture. So put play equipment and outdoor furniture in the sun, not the shade. It looks like Bambi is checking out the slide, but what I want you to notice is the area where the yard meets the woods. This arrangement puts the person who mows the grass at great risk because they'll be brushing into the brush where ticks like to hang out. It also allows ticks to easily crawl into the yard. By putting in a buffer zone, you can cut that risk substantially. Using non-porous materials like gravel and rock that don't hold moisture increases the chance that ticks would dry out crossing the buffer zone. In some instances, it makes sense to use insecticides on your property. If you want to apply them yourself, I'd recommend you read the Tick Management Handbook that was developed by experts in Connecticut. It's available online. Google it. The first year, spray in the spring to kill nymphs and in the fall to kill adults. After that, a spring treatment should be enough. You don't have to do the entire property. Focus on areas that would attract mice and or ticks. Spray the periphery of the lawn, but not the sunny areas. This talk can be summarized into a few main points. One, Lyme is a complex illness that can be tough to diagnose and treat. For some, the infection is costly and disabling. Two, many people are at high risk for becoming infected, and the CDC estimates suggest that roughly 300,000 people will become infected each year. Three, prevention strategies work, especially when they're combined in a multi-layered approach. We have strategies for people, pets, and property, but to work, they must become part of your everyday routines at home, and especially when you're exposed to tick habitat. Thanks for watching. I hope you found the information helpful. Share it with your friends and family. For more tips and facts, go to our website, www.partnershipfortickborndiseaseseducation.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Once again, thank you.